I think one of the conceptions is that it's like it's like a formal diagnosis. It's more a symptom than anything. Mm -hmm, It's mm -hmm. not like you have psychosis and then you have like this mental illness. It's like it's a sign that something else is going on. Mm. So like you can have psychosis from like uh, substance substance use. You can have psychosis from like having bipolar disorder. You can even have psychosis from like a urinary tract infection. Mm. So like depending on what's going on in your Mm. life and depending like on your circumstances psychosis could be like a symptom of a lot of different things Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think the other thing to remember too is that i think like the fear that surrounds psychosis is that like people who are psychotic are uh, like dangerous but really they're a danger to themselves more than anything else like a person who's experiencing a psychotic break is more likely i think to harm themselves than to harm someone else like most likely i don't want to like speak for everyone but Um, I think that that's something that that would be good because people think that it's so scary and that people experiencing psychosis or people who are psychotic, um, you know, that they're dangerous um, to everybody and that you should avoid them. But really like bringing them in and supporting them and recognizing that they're still a person just experiencing a symptom. And it's not like this is an overarching factor of who they are. And like, you know, they're a person beyond that. So, yeah, I think Mm -hmm. it also that it like cuts across every social domain, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like it doesn't matter about like race, religion, social class, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you live in the world, Um, like psychosis can still affect someone. So it's Mm -hmm. not just like the different stereotypes that other people may have about like a single type of person who has psychosis. It's Mm -hmm. like it's like the general public. It can be be pretty much anyone. Mm -hmm. And I do think now that I've gone through psychosis as well, whenever I see, because it's worth acknowledging that a lot of people who I think are street involved too, like maybe experiencing mental health issues and it makes it hard for them to function in society. And when I see that, it just makes me so sad because I was very fortunate to have supports in place for recovery Um, and seeing people who are, you know, just wandering around on the street, like muttering to themselves and, and struggling. I just wish that they could have the same access to supports and compassion that I was, I was, um so fortunate to receive yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that there's no cure i know you talked Mm -hmm. a bit about that earlier Mm -hmm. because like people think that like once you have psychosis like that's it your life's over like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's the end of the road so to speak but there's like there's medications there's different types of therapies Mm -hmm. there's like different types of psychosocial supports Mm -hmm. there's like a whole bunch of different things that that can be done to help people recover from psychosis Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily like a life ending event Mm -hmm. for me it was definitely life changing me too it it affected me in like huge ways but like my life's gone on i've done Mm -hmm. like better now after my psychosis than i did Mm -hmm. before Mm -hmm. i don't know who i would be now if i hadn't gone through it honestly Mm -hmm. um and that isn't to say that it's it's worth going through i wouldn't recommend it but um yeah and i also wish more people would recognize how hurtful it is to hear people throwing words like psychotic and crazy around because i think that it, some people are like desensitized to it and they'll say like oh like they were being psychotic or like uh this person's just being crazy and it's like i i hear that when people my friends that don't know that i've gone through that experience don't realize like how much it personally affects me and kind of bums me out to hear them talk like that about people so yeah i mean i think that it's it can the first step is being able to recognize that's what ha- what's happening because people who are going through psychosis might self-isolate um and begin to behave erratically and in a way that people might find off-putting and so it's easy for people who are experiencing that to be become further kind of ostracized from their communities and that is not conducive to recovery at all Um, it can make things much worse especially if you're struggling just to do the basic maintenance and like everyday human functioning like cleaning and like taking care of yourself like that's a nice way to show up for a friend like if you know that they're struggling like reaching out like a lot and saying like, do you need help? Like I can come like, well, I'll help you clean. And just like all these different ways that you can support them, just like getting things done and and showing up for them and and reaching out, even if they seem like they might be self-isolating. That's that's an indicator that they really need you to show up for them and to reach out to them and not just Mm -hmm. like let them take, and not to take it personally either, so. Yeah, I think Showing up is a big piece of it. And so it's mm-hmm. like listening when you do show up. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like I know for me, there were some people who would like 
show up but not listen to me Mm -hmm. and like them being there was definitely a help Mm -hmm. like i needed people around me to be able to like get out of my head and figure out like what's going on Mm -hmm. but to actually like sit there and like pay attention to what i'm saying and pay Mm -hmm. attention to what i'm saying i need Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was really important too Mm because if someone's just showing up and they're trying to like impose their own reality on me Mm. like sometimes that works but most of the time Mm. it doesn't really yeah and i think sometimes when people are trying to offer comfort they they might inadvertently be dismissive of something that someone's going through Um, especially if you're telling people like yo i'm scared like i think i'm hallucinating i think it can be hard to tell people to tell someone like that's scary. Like, I'm sorry that that's happening to you. And it might be easier to just say like, are you sure? Like it's, that's probably not what it is. Um, Cause I think I had, I had a little bit of that too, but you, you don't want to invalidate people's experiences and you want to really like, like you said, listen to them, like, and not just like, not just be paternalistic or pity them or kind of give them space without actually listening and perceiving what they're saying and trying to think about what more you can, you can offer in, in, in terms of support. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think like tying into that, like giving advice helped me at certain points, Mm -hmm. but for the most part, I just need to figure out what was going on in myself Mm -hmm. because there was so many different like things that were happening Mm -hmm. that I couldn't really follow through on a lot of advice. I know Mm -hmm. like when I was in psychosis, like right before I was hospitalized, Mm -hmm. actually, um, I was told to go see a therapist Mm -hmm. and, um, I went to go like see a therapist mm-hmm. and I went to like the place on campus to like go talk to someone and mm-hmm. I showed up and I'm like, I want to see a therapist. And they're like, do you have an appointment? I'm like, no. And they're like, all right, do you want an appointment for later? I'm like, I can't see one now. And they're like, yeah. no. So yeah, like, yeah, it's hard because like advice only goes so far mm-hmm. and it works for the person who gave it, but not always for the person who's receiving it. Yeah. It's true. And even if it's like you're telling a friend that you think that they should go get help or see someone to go with them to do that, because it can be very, very frustrating to try and engage in the mental health care system. It can be exhausting and it can make you feel hopeless if you're already feeling bad. Like it can really, really solidify that this feeling of like nobody's going to help me, like nobody's here for me. Um, And definitely when I was going through it, I had a friend who who sat with me when I called like the suicide hotline to explain how I was feeling and who brought me to the psych ward when I was trying to self admit and and they turned me away anyway. Um, But it was at least nice that there was someone willing to do that for me. Um, And it made me feel a little less alone, but uh, yeah. I think another thing would be to be able to recognize which of your friends might be more at risk for psychosis and being able to maybe like look out for them in that way because especially when you're young i think it's you you don't always realize the the long-term consequences things might have on you and you're maybe not and if you you can't think of it for yourself maybe it's easier to think about how things might be affecting your friends um yeah and that's 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 a big one too Mm, and thinking about ways that parents can support too i think because i mean parents uh, I've talked to a lot of parents now who have had their parents go through psychosis because they want to hear about what it was like so they can better understand what their child went through. And um, I think having really candid conversations about mental health and psychosis and family mental health history is very crucial because it can save people a lot of trouble if they know that there is a pre a prerequisite there. Because if you don't know, you're going to just assume that it's it's not likely. You're going to say nobody nobody in my family has schizophrenia. Like unless unless you talk about it, you just don't know. So. I um I remember when I entered treatment for cannabis use disorder post psychosis whenever I was in recovery and I was also heavily medicated on antipsychotic medication, um, telling myself like at first like I'm like, I'm never gonna do this again like this this was so horrific like I can't believe this has happened to me like I like, I'm not gonna smoke weed anymore, but then probably like a week later I was honestly like I'm gonna be honest I was smoking weed again but I was having like drug interactions and suddenly like smoking weed would affect me in a much different way and I would be very much more heavily sedated and it 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 wasn't good my teachers asked if I was taking like horse tranquilizers like straight up and I was like no like I'm just on anti-psychotic medication (laughs) please (laughs) but I was mixing it with other things but um the way that it's changed now is that my my relationship with cannabis I still have one like I still use cannabis but I try and use it in a much more more mindful way which is skills that I learned when I did like mindfulness dialectical behavioral therapy around cannabis use um and just being 
being mindful and reflecting on like where I'm at with my relationship with cannabis, which is something I never did when I was in high school. Uh, I think I can recognize like when it's getting to be too much, when it's impeding my, um, my performance, whether it's like, you know, just taking care of myself, whether it's at school, whether it's at work, whether it's with, with friends, I'm not going out as much cause I, I'm just staying in. Like I can, I can recognize when it's a problem and I know kind of what my limits are. And like, I, I don't want us to be smoking in the morning. I know when I can recognize when it's an appropriate time to smoke. Meanwhile, when I was in high school, I was high constantly, like between classes getting high. So, I mean, those are skills that I've been able to learn, but I, it would have been beneficial for me to be taught those skills from like a harm reduction approach to substance use education. So rather than just telling me like, you shouldn't smoke weed, it's bad. And it'll, you know, it could cause like schizophrenia or psychosis and not really even differentiating between that and getting into like what that actually means. Um, if I had just had a harm reduction approach that said, you know, there's a spectrum of use and like using every day is, is much worse than just using occasionally. Or if you're using shatter or edibles, they're, they're much more potent. Or if you just try and stick to CBD weed, it'll be a lot less, um, it'll like decrease some of the risks associated with it. So these are all things that I think we could be telling young people who use cannabis that I've had to figure out through like trial and error and the, the many experiences that I've had since then. But yeah. Do you mind if I ask like what, like what harm reduction methods you use now? Yeah. I mean, I, I predominantly only uh, use cannabis socially. I, I don't do it by myself, which is something that I, I, I think that's also maybe just about, I don't know if it's a byproduct of getting older or if it's the, the strains that are on the market now, but smoking weed by myself isn't as enjoyable as it used to be. Um, and I think that's like a lot of people's approach to drinking too, like drinking socially versus if you start to drink uh, like at home a lot by yourself um, and just trying to engage engage in things without being stoned. And if I start to have this mindset that like, oh, this will be better if I'm stoned, like, oh, I'm going to eat. It'll be better if I'm stoned or, oh, I'm going to go do this thing. It'll be better if I'm stoned. Like I've definitely like, I'm very mindful of that. Cause that's how I was all throughout high school. I thought being high would make everything better. And I, I recognize that that's very much not the case. Um, I'm mindful about the, the methods of consumption that I use. I'm mindful about what strains I'm using. Cause some of them I know I, I don't want to use because some of them are extremely psychoactive and I don't like the way that those strains make me feel. Um, yeah. So I'm just like not too much, not too often, mostly with friends and, and, um, yeah, that's like some of the harm reduction practice. I, I suppose I, that I would, I'd say I engage in. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for me, like I tried smoking pot a couple of times, like I, after my episode, like I went back to substances pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I realized one day that like I couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to quit everything and I had a couple relapses, but eventually I went to treatment and I figured out like that it wasn't really working for me, but mm -hmm. it always like was on the back of my mind. Like mm -hmm. what if I, what if I just use CBD? What if I just uh, like did it medically? What if I just like found uh, like a reliable source and like, all those things kind of like flutter around until I actually I went through the steps to get like a medical authorization to use cannabis. Mm -hmm. So I got like not a prescription because they don't write prescriptions, but mm -hmm. like a, a referral to a cannabis clinic. And mm -hmm. I got like actual like medicinal CBD oil. Mm -hmm. And I tried that out one weekend and like I have to say it just like messed me up. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not mm -hmm. gonna lie, for a month afterwards, I didn't use it, but I still fell off. Mm -hmm. I still like didn't feel like myself, and I didn't feel like I like was the person I wanted to be. I felt slowed. I felt like a little confused all the time. I couldn't mm -hmm. concentrate, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so like for me, I just can't use like anything mm -hmm. to do with pot anymore because it's it's not it doesn't work for me. Yeah, I yeah. think the. Uh I don't know if it's the older I get or what it is, but I, I do think I get to a point where it just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem as worth it. I don't know. I think when you're young, even like with drinking, you can, you can deal with a hangover and you're like, oh, it's fine. I can't, I can't drink alcohol. It makes me sick. But um, I don't know. It gets to a point where the, the like cost benefit kind of comparison of, of using cannabis, sometimes it just seems like not worth it. I don't know. Uh, but then you can get in habits, especially if you're socializing with people who use cannabis a lot, which I do. Um, it can be hard to avoid, but um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's actually one thing that I had to figure out too. Cause mm -hmm. I like, I know a lot of people who still smoke mm -hmm. and like it was weird at first. Cause mm -hmm. like I used to smoke with them and then mm -hmm. I stopped and then mm -hmm. like I did for a little bit and then I stopped mm -hmm. again. So like I really had to learn how to draw like firm boundaries with people. Mm -hmm. 
because like sometimes people would offer sometimes it wouldn't even mean anything by mm. it. just like you're going around in a circle and mm -hmm. like you're in the circle so yeah. like, they just offer it to you but yeah. like learning how to draw those boundaries for me was really important because mm -hmm. like everyone is different and some people will be able to smoke some people not and some people like well everyone's gonna have different relationships mm -hmm. and being able to know those relationships and critically think about like what it is that like you want and what it is you can handle and what it is like that like is worth it like mm -hmm. you said mm -hmm. like it's really important to be able to enforce that too because if i'm aware of something and i'm aware that something isn't good for me but i can't like draw a boundary mm -hmm. to like get it out of my life then it becomes like more problematic i guess like mm -hmm. it, there's more harms with it than if i just like was able to like let go of it mm -hmm. so like once i knew for a fact that pot wasn't for me i had to really learn how to how to say no and like keep that boundary even if like I really wanted to. Yeah, I still find myself in, in situations where I, I, I set a boundary and I'm like, I'm tonight, like I'm not smoking, like I want to stay kind of sober, sober state of mind. But then when it when it the offer arises, it's it's it is hard to say no. And I, I often will will cave in or like I'll have a boundary where I like I don't smoke bongs because bongs just put my tolerance way, way up. And then suddenly I'm like further on into that spectrum of like use where it's like, oh, it was just occasional use. But then suddenly like my tolerance is so high that I want I just am thinking about smoking weed constantly. And I, and I can recognize that. And I think it's as someone who has a history of cannabis use disorder, I recognize that this is like predisposed and like it, it, it's like any addiction where it's like you never really like recover like you're in recovery and like it's always something that's just at the back of your mind is like this thing that i had which was like very problematic substance use with with, with cannabis which is like a soft drug to some people but it, it everyone responds to it differently and, and it can definitely be be dangerous for some people um but that isn't to discredit like and i don't want people to, to think that it's fear-mongering because definitely not everyone experiences that but I don't think that that's worth invalidating people's experiences for whom it was. Um, and just like you said, sometimes that people don't mean harm by it. They're just passing a joint around and they offer it to you. But I think if someone, you know, says like, no, thank you, that you should be very respectful of that and you shouldn't push and you shouldn't pry, you shouldn't ask. Just like if someone says like, no, thank you to a drink, people, you know, they're like, oh, why, why aren't you drinking? Are you pregnant? And it's like, you don't owe anyone an answer for why you don't want to. And it's the same thing with cannabis. Like, I just, I'm good. Thanks. But yeah. Yeah. I think you did make a good point that like some people will have like good experiences on it and mm -hmm. some people like want to share those experiences mm -hmm. with other people. Mm -hmm. So like that could be the reason why they want to like they want you to like use with them. Mm -hmm. But you have to know where you're coming from and mm -hmm. where you're at. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about like being able to hear each other's mm -hmm. stories mm -hmm. and like just what that experience is like to hear someone else who's been through something similar mm -hmm. so what, what what did it feel like when you heard like my story well whenever i was listening to you share your experience of psychosis i i think i felt comforted mm -hmm. on i felt pretty comforted because i haven't i don't think like listened to someone share such a similar experience and it's like, usually I'm the one sharing the experience and, and people mm -hmm. are like, oh, thank you. Like, that was so nice. But then as someone who's gone through it as well, it just felt really like, I don't know. It's like, it is an instant connection. I'm like, oh, you've gone through that. And with mm -hmm. psychosis, it's like either you don't know people who have gone through it or if you do, like they probably might not tell you about it. Um, so listening to you talk about it, I made so many connections to what I went through. And I remember you you were presenting and you were talking about how like, oh, it became like a real big part of my identity. And I think we just like made eye contact and kind of nodded at each other because I yeah. was like, yeah, same. Like, I know exactly mm -hmm. what that's like and and how how it makes it so much harder. Yeah, because like for me, it was like that was who I was. Like mm -hmm. I was a I was a stoner. I was a stoner. Right? Yeah, yeah, same. So it's like once I invest that much of myself mm -hmm. into it, like what else am I? Like I don't have room for anything else. That's what mm -hmm. I don't like about labels a lot of the time because mm -hmm. like I was a stoner, so I couldn't be like, I couldn't be engaged in school. I couldn't be engaged in mm -hmm. sports. I couldn't like have friends outside the circle. Mm -hmm. like, I was a stoner. Like mm -hmm. that was the top priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at first I think whenever I got that like label where like I was a mm -hmm. stoner, because I mean, as I had mentioned, like I, I'd started off in, in elementary school and uh, junior high being like kind of like the depressed weird kid. Like they were mm -hmm. like, you're the emo kid. And like, that's how I was labeled. And so, 
It's like, first I was the annoying kid, the high energy kid. Then I was the emo kid because getting called annoying made me freaking sad. And then, and so then I get to high school and like, I have this opportunity to kind of redefine myself. And even though I was doing so much other stuff, like I was involved in the music department, like I was in band, I was in choir, I was doing theater. And I was like, I was doing lead roles in the musicals. No one, no one like really saw me as that. Everyone mm -hmm. saw me as a stoner. And that was, that was the thing. And I think I was definitely fine with it at first because I was like, well, at least they're not calling me like emo anymore and sad. And like, they think I'm fun to be around now. So like, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And then you kind of start to play it up and you're like, yeah, like being the stoner and, and it, it definitely beco becomes a big part of your, your identity, but then it can leave you feeling pretty empty whenever you start to feel less fulfilled by, by all the other things that you had in your life before you started smoking weed all the time. Yeah. Because your identity like collapses, right? It's yeah. Like, this is who I was. I'm not that anymore. Then what am I? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. And I think right. at first, like I could, I could handle the, the label because it made me, it made me comfortable because it was, it was something new. But then, and and I could separate myself. I'm like, oh, everyone thinks I'm a stoner. But then after yeah. a while, you start to self-identify as such. You're like, you, you believe mm -hmm. it because that's what people tell you all the time. Um, and so then it really, that's when it becomes like really ingrained, I think. And, and then it's, it's scary the idea of not smoking weed anymore because. It, your identity is like so tied to this to this thing but then mm -hmm. it feels good whenever you can kind of move beyond it and break break free from it even though it's like yeah. now still what, what i'm doing is like talking about cannabis and substance use but it's it's mm -hmm. in a way that people i guess are fine more respectable so yeah. <laughs> it's weird how that works yeah, yeah yeah they're like stop talking about weed okay and then they're like wait can you come talk about weed and i'm like okay yeah, yeah. but talking I'll to your friends it. is like mm -hmm. bad but talking to like a room full of people yeah good. exactly yeah. exactly yeah when I heard you talk about stigma, actually, that really resonated with me, mm -hmm. especially when you were like up on a, in front of all the people. Mm -hmm, like it was, mm -hmm. it was really cool because you put it in a way that like really resonated with me that you broke it down into like all the different parts. Mm -hmm. So not just like internalized stigma, not just like stigma from your peer group, not just stigma from like the other people around you, mm -hmm. but like, like societal stigma mm -hmm. too. And like the propagation of all of that mm -hmm. through like different, different sources of like things that we, like ingest is the wrong word consume consume yeah consume. media just like interactions like so many little ways that it kind of like permeates and yeah because it starts what like kind of systemically mm -hmm. and then it's like societally and then it's interpersonally and then all of a sudden it's like this deeply rooted stigma that you have against yourself because you're like well i guess all i am is a stoner right like mm -hmm. and then then you really stop caring about school and then you really stop caring about sports or theater or art or anything because you're like well i guess i'm just gonna go smoke weed because it's all anyone expects from me yeah yeah i was I was actually on the national team for fencing mm -hmm. before I was like a complete stoner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like that didn't matter to me anymore because mm -hmm. I, I was a stoner now. Like, yeah. I didn't need that. That was yeah. part of the past. And, and you so, went through it in college, right? Yeah. So like I, I started really smoking pot in high school. Mm -hmm. And then I actually had my episode in university. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, it was about like a couple years from like the time I was smoking like every day until mm -hmm. like I had my episode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But like there were there were little signs, like warning signs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like every once in a while I'd have like an experience I couldn't explain. I'd just kinda like shove it to the side. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're stoned all the time. You're yeah. like, well, whatever. It's I'm, just I'm the pot. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. And so people will tell you too if you're mm -hmm. like, what and they're like, it's just the pot. And you're like, okay. Yeah. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, because for me it was in high school that I I'd had it and I'm kind of, if anything, glad that I got it out of the way almost because yeah. uh, I feel like going through it in college would be like so rough and then trying to reintegrate because even so like it happened to me when I was 17 which is like I guess kind of early for some people but I, I had started smoking in ninth grade and then by 11th grade it was like I it was like I I really got into the pot like I really mm. liked it um and I think genetically too like I have family members that like smoke almost like chronically and even now like I go to visit family and it's acceptable so it's like they're all smoking like my like my mom's side will be drinking and my dad's side will be like smoking or something like that and I don't know, but um, yeah, I think I felt kind of glad to get it out of the way because even so, like trying to get back into 12th grade when I was on antipsychotic medication was so rough, at least like, and I was already at home. So it's not like I was away from home when it happened, but um, yeah, like trying to, to write an essay in like my 12th grade English class about Hamlet and the commentary on like, like it's a lot of heavy yeah. mental health themes was yeah. my grade 12 like literacy class so I, and i'm just like so heavily medicated on like thought suppressing drugs that i like just can't even write 
like a, like a sentence. I'm like, I don't even know. Like I can't, I'm trying to read, I can't retain anything. And luckily everyone like was like pretty supportive. But if I, if it happened when I was in school and I was like paying to attend school and then having to deal with that, I can't even imagine. Yeah, no, I, I had a terrible time of it. Cause like I, it was like right around exam time that I got hospitalized too. Oh, and stress I'm sure was yeah, like a big catalyst. hundred mm -hmm. percent. And like I had to drop courses afterwards. And like most of my courses were fine. I got like a medical note saying mm -hmm. like stuff, but there was one course that like wouldn't let me drop it. Mm. I have an F in that course because I didn't write the final exam because mm. they didn't accept psychosis as like a, as a reason for not showing up, I guess. Wow. <laughs> I was in the hospital at the time, but you know, gotta, yeah. gotta show up. But yeah. it, I actually tried going to class, uh, going back to school, university a couple times, like mm -hmm. after my episode, like right away. Mm -hmm. Like I had my episode in like the end of November, hospitalized up until like mid December. And then mm -hmm. January, I went back to school, mm -hmm. but I, couldn't do it and like mm -hmm. i tried again in the in the september uh semester but i couldn't do it so it actually took me like coming back and just regrouping for mm -hmm. like a solid like eight months mm -hmm. until i actually got into a good headspace and mm -hmm. i went back to college and mm -hmm. yeah yeah because i feel like even so it's like uh, thinking about like the the phase of like heaviest cannabis use is kind of like there was no development that was happening for me like I definitely mm -hmm. feel like I had an experience of kind of stunted emotional and developmental growth because I didn't learn coping skills because like why would I learn coping skills when I can just mm -hmm. smoke weed about it yeah so then all of a sudden it's like okay like I was hospitalized before grade 12 and then I went through grade 12 like medicated and kind of struggling and even took a year off before going because my parents were like well you know like oh just like yeah don't push yourself too hard and then even so getting to school, I was like, I didn't have the same skill set that my peers did going into it. Like they, I'm like, you have coping skills. Like you mm -hmm. have, you know how to manage your stress. Like, I don't know how to do this. Like yeah. I'm crying in the bathroom every day. Like, this is great. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it still makes you stronger. And then like you learn yeah. to cope, but. Yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest things I did learn was mm -hmm. like learning to cope with stress, learning mm -hmm. to cope with emotions, learning to like face them mm -hmm. and like still be myself when I do it and not yeah. like, run away into like callousness or anger mm -hmm. or like just fear mm -hmm. um but to like embrace it and to like actually go fully into it and mm -hmm. figure out like how can i be myself in this situation mm -hmm. and how can i like do the best here that mm -hmm. myself could ever do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and before my episode like i used to think like what's like the least amount of work I can do mm -hmm. in order to like get the results I need to be able to yeah. move to the next step. Yeah. Well, because you have such low expectations of yourself because mm -hmm. everybody else has such low expectations of you because they don't yeah. think very much of stoners. Like, let's be mm -hmm. honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, it's too bad. It's yeah. too bad. But I think that, um, yeah, like learning how to be patient with yourself and especially like in, in the recovery phase is like very important because mm -hmm. it, it, it can be frustrating when you're like, I just want to be able to like go to school and not like have a panic attack by myself in the bathroom because okay like nobody else seems to be doing this like why can't i just do this what everybody else is doing but you kind of have to recognize that it's like you do it at your own pace and everyone's recovery is kind of different and then like you can just be patient and that, mm. and that it, yeah it's just yeah fun. and that like lifelong learning lifelong learning is a thing mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. it doesn't end after high school mm -hmm, or it doesn't mm -hmm. end after like university mm -hmm. like you can always learn new things and you can always learn how to like improve yourself mm. and like improve the ways that you act so mm. that you can be like more resilient and more mm -hmm. able to like take on the things that like life has to offer. Absolutely. And I think that like with recovery from something like psychosis and like uh, like drug induced brain damage, which is kind of how they how they phrase it. It makes you kind of think like, oh, well, my brain's like broken now. Like, mm -hmm. like it's not it's not very like hopeful. But whenever you start emphasizing like neuroplasticity and that like the brain can like can work to heal itself. And and because I was like s still under 25 whenever everything happened, I mean, your brain is still very much developing. And that's and like then finally, that's like a message of hope. It's like they use it for, for fear so much. Though, like your brain's developing, like be careful. But then it's like after the episode it's kind of like your brain is still developing so so be hopeful that like mm -hmm. your brain will like it'll it'll heal itself and like it, you'll be able to learn and like it, it'll be okay and you're not like it's not over yeah it's just getting started mm -hmm. so you don't hear those messaging no. very often mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. i know for me like it was hard for me to like see a better way because i didn't know anyone who like had went through the mm -hmm, same things mm -hmm. So like being able to have conversations like this and being able to like talk openly and like mm -hmm. you're holding down a job, I'm holding down a job, like 
we're productive members of society. Like we both talked at a conference today. Yeah, and, yeah we're doing like, good. We're, proud of yeah, you. <laughs> proud of you too. Thanks. Doing good. Sick. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like there is life after, mm-hmm. and like it can be a fulfilling life, and mm-hmm. it can be fun, and you yeah. can have like an adventure. Totally. It's not not the end of the road. No, absolutely yeah. not. 